Welcome to the Presbyterian Church in Westfield. You know, this is the last installment in a little worship series we've been doing on gratitude. So if you've missed us uh, before, you're catching us for the first time on this series, go back and watch the other ones uh, after you've seen this. Uh, you don't have to watch them consecutively, but for your information, uh, first in the series, we stopped, we paused to consider how to pay attention to reasons for gratitude in our lives. And second, we then heard the wisdom from Tom Court on expressing our gratitude, expressing our love by showing up, by making the call, by reaching out to people and making sure that they see that we're present, that we're there. Now, in just a little bit, you'll be hearing from our associate pastor, uh, Marcy Ryan, as she reflects on the ancient story of Hannah, a, a woman who has a lot to teach us about saying thanks, about acting in a life of gratitude. Well, together we are Grateful PCW, and I am grateful for you. Good morning and grace and peace from your PCW family. My name is Marcy Ryan and I'm your associate pastor for Congregational Life. As we turn towards our scripture passage for this morning, I want us to just take a deep breath. Set 
settle in with your cup of coffee or your tea or water. And remember that God is with you and within you. And we now have an opportunity to hear from the word of the Lord as it comes to us from 1 Samuel 2, verses 1 through 10. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no one holy like the Lord. No one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. And those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry are fat with spoil. The barren have borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might does one prevail. Now oh, the Lord... His adversaries shall be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, and he will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of each of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. And may we encounter your truth, be empowered by your spirit, and embraced by your love. We ask this in your name. Amen. So we're at a crossroads of a lot of different seasons and transitions. So in one way, we're coming to a close for PCW's sermon series on gratitude and what being grateful looks like. We've heard from Pastor Jeremy that we are a part of an unfinished story, and yet in the midst of a story, we are invited to live with gratitude, even when it's hard to know what to be grateful for. We heard last week from Pastor Tom that we're encouraged to seek out and be with the people for whom we are grateful for and seek them out before winter and share in that love with them. Yet in another way, we're also in ordinary time and specifically today, all around the world, people are celebrating what they call Christ the King Sunday. Now, Christ the King Sunday would be more like saying Christ the CEO or Christ the President Sunday, which for CEO, President, or King, these titles can bring up a wide variety of emotions because typically, no matter who is in power or who is ruling, we see leaders acting in a way that we don't necessarily want to attribute to Christ-like actions which is exactly why this liturgical calendar change was made in the 1920s, just to give you a little bit of a background. So compared to liturgical seasons like Advent, which have been celebrated for more than a thousand years, Christ the King has really only been around for some 90 years and was added even out of the political climate then. And yet we're at another crossroad. We're in the season of fall. We're in the thick of it. 
where the leaves are changing and the air is crisp and for some reason, Autumn Leaves by Nat King Cole keeps running through my head. The days are getting shorter, yet the warmth of the holidays is among us. And in the midst of all these different seasons and transitions coming to a head, I'm sure like many of you, you've started to think about your Thanksgiving, what that will look like this year. True story, Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday, not only because it is probably one of the least commercialized holidays, but it's also one of the few days where wearing sweatpants and talking about the Westminster dog show typically happen at the same time. But it's also a place where you're gathered around a table, a table that is meant to be filled with love, family, friends, and good food with the promise of even better leftovers. One of the most memorable Thanksgiving meals I've ever had was at my grandparents' home when I was about 12 years old. And I remember it because that was the year I went from sitting at the kids' table to sitting at the adult table. All of my life up until that point, it was just me and my cousins at a small card table in a corner, just wondering and imagining what all of our parents were talking about. Now, we had guessed for so many years what they could possibly be talking about. You know, my one cousin is saying, oh, you know, politics probably. And another saying, oh, they're probably just talking about church. And I always say, guys, guys, they're probably just talking about something dumb like grocery lists. Well, this was the year I was upgraded from the kids' card table to the esteemed dining table. And it was one to be remembered. I had dreamed for so long what it was going to be like sitting at that big oak table with perfectly arranged autumnal tablescapes and of course a front seat for all of the conversation the adults were having. And I remember my Mimi brought me over to my seat that had my name on it, which never happened at that other table, and sat me down next to her, a seat of honor even. She wanted to make sure I felt comfortable. And so after we said grace and began passing around our Thanksgiving feast, you know, with all the sides and the goodies, she started to ask me how school, how sports, and just in general, how things in life were going for me. I could not believe it. It was my first time at the adult table and already I was the center of conversation. However, being that I was 12 and didn't necessarily have the social cues to not stop eating before starting to talk, I had an unfortunate mishap of eating my Thanksgiving meal with my big yabber open. And it only got worse when I began to suddenly feel a hint of a hint of a tickle in my nose and in the back of my throat that resembled a sneeze. I tried to stifle it by shoving more food in my mouth. But unfortunately, in a battle of food versus body, my body won and I sneezed. Except I didn't just sneeze, but more or less, it was a Macy's Day parade spectacle of confetti turkey shooting all over the table. Yeah, that happened. And as everyone did a collective fork drop and slow turned towards me, I was embarrassed, bright red with guilt that I had ruined my chances to ever sit at the adult table again and ashamed that I had ruined, I had single-handedly ruined our Thanksgiving meal. And so what did I do? I did what any logical person would do. I hid under the table. Now, funny or humorous as it is to have seen this, it reminds me this morning especially, but so often that there are few 
things in this world that we can control. We can't control the sun coming up or down. We don't have control over other people's experiences or emotions. And we certainly can't control when our body decides to sneeze turkey. We have little control in our world. The year we were born, our race, our family, where we grew up, and the state of humanity. We have little control. And yet this may seem like a contradictory statement. However, I believe we also have agency over how we show up in the world. Sure, we can't control the traffic on the parkway, but we sure can control on how we show up by, you know, going with the flow of traffic and not having road rage. Totally just as an aside. We have control on how we are to act and be in this world in spite of uncontrollable circumstances. Our scripture passage for this morning is at the tail end of Hannah's big moment in the arc of scripture. Now, at first glance, Hannah's story seems simple. She's unable to have children, so she prays. God gives her a baby But then she gives the baby back up to be dedicated to the temple. However, peel back any of those layers and you'll see a complex and dynamic story with grief and joy. So the beginning of this chapter includes a bit of background for us as readers telling us the family system of Elkanah. Elkanah has two wives, Hannah, who had no children, and Peninnah, who had several children. Now, at this time, not having children was like a death sentence for Hannah. That meant she had no status, nothing to give her value or purpose in society, definitely a failure in the family, and especially for Hannah, no way to express her deep love through motherhood. It also didn't help that Peninnah was really cruel and would mock Hannah for being barren. It was kind of like an ancient mean girls kind of discourse. My womb is way more fruitful than yours. You'll never amount to anything. And so one night in particular, Hannah loses her cool and goes to the temple and begins to pray. She openly weeps and bitterly prays, praying to God that he would listen to her and show up, even so much that she made a vow that if she were to have a child, she would dedicate them to the Lord. Now, after some banter with Eli, the priest, she went home and found that indeed she was pregnant. It worked. Her plan totally worked. She was finally pregnant and finally had purpose in the world. But then that whole giving the child back part was brought up. And while she realized her days were numbered with her beloved child, we hear that she gives birth to a young boy named Samuel, which means God has heard. And after he was weaned, he was left at the temple. You just pause here for a moment. Imagine leaving a toddler behind after all these years. And yes, even with the vow, she knew it was coming. But with the raw emotion and grief and longing that comes with saying goodbye to him, I can only imagine if I were Hannah, I'd want to be alone or just take a few days to process But then Hannah does something different. She shows up in a different way in the midst of her circumstances. She chooses a new way. She sings a song. She expresses heartfelt praise and love for God and sings of a triumphant Lord who will be with us in all seasons and will even lift up the hungry, the poor, the needy, and the lowly. And in fact, she doesn't just proclaim that the Lord is mighty, but she expresses the great lengths God will go to to protect and provide for each person, no matter their status. 
And I think it's important to recognize that this song of praise, the scripture that we read this morning, comes right after she has dedicated her son to the Lord. This long-awaited son who would soon be a prophet and priest, but for now was just Hannah's baby. And when she leaves him, she isn't angry at God or angry at herself for making this vow. She simply expresses gratitude. She expresses gratitude in a way that could seem odd or confusing to the outsider. But we know, we know why Hannah has chosen to show up with gratitude. Gratitude for God and all of the ways God provides, even beyond her own situation and circumstances. She chooses gratitude. Many of us quite possibly have situations right now that are challenging, difficult, painful, and even confusing. And all of us have seen the pain in the world and we even see what we've given up or the losses we've all had. There are circumstances that we unfortunately won't be able to control. So then what can we learn from Hannah? Because we see a woman who chooses gratitude not to be vapid or out of ignorance, but because Hannah was tuned into something much deeper and stronger than herself. Hope. Hope that her choices would not be in vain. Hope that God is bigger than any one situation. Hope that God can do incredible and impossible things. Hope that we don't have control over everything. And that's actually a really good thing. Hope is the beat of Hannah's song of gratitude, and it very well can be yours and mine too. Going back to my Thanksgiving meal, where I'm currently hiding under the table after the turkey sneeze. I remember hiding and just being so embarrassed uh, by this out of control situation. But then to my surprise, my Mimi peeked her head under this beautiful oak table with the perfectly arranged autumnal tablescape and smiled. And she said, there you are. Why are you hiding? And I muttered something like, I sneezed, I'm an embarrassment to all names and all things of Thanksgiving, and I ruined your nice tablecloth, and I ruined everything. And I won't forget she looked at me with such grace and love in her eyes saying, Oh, Marcy, I am so glad you're here. In fact, I think it was funny. I am so thankful for you. Years later, she did admit that in fact, she did think it was gross and kind of unfortunate that it did happen. However, in that moment, she chose gratitude and love. In the uncontrollable, she chose gratitude. That same gratitude shaped and inspired me, and maybe it can inspire you too. This week, there will be a lot of things you can name to be grateful for, especially with Thanksgiving this week. But take time to reflect on what your song would be. We heard what Hannah sang, but what would your song of gratitude be? What and who in this world gives you hope? Because then maybe, just maybe, as the people of God, even in the midst of our out of control situations, we can be like Hannah who confidently proclaims, there is no holy one like the Lord. No one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Amen. Amen.
morning. My name is Bill Tittle. I'm the chairman of the Stewardship Commission at this church. I'm delighted to report to you on the status of the Welcome Home Stewardship Campaign. As of November 9th, 152 pledges totaling $669,000 had been received. That's already 93% of the total amount pledged last year. The average pledge of the 124 who have pledged both last year and this year, the average pledge is up 20% in average value. In addition, we have 28 new pledges that have been received from newer members. So the first thing I want to do is thank all of you who have already pledged and have done so so generously. It's a sign that many are appreciating all the good things PCW is doing for its members, the nearby community, and beyond. We've also received feedback that others intend to pledge and join in the warm feeling you get when you support and a vibrant church like this one is. Year-end giving is another opportunity before the end of the year you might consider. PCW is coming back with new staff, new programs, and a commitment to its vision. I invite any of you who have not yet pledged to join the party, there's still time. It will make you feel good and will allow us to continue our path forward to do God's worth. Uh, this is the last time you're gonna hear this. This is the four Ps I want you to think about uh, as you consider your pledge. First thing is to pray about it. Second thing is uh, consider giving proportionally to what you have received. Thirdly, take pleasure in your gift. And fourthly, find a feeling of peace with your decision. If you have any questions, I invite you to speak to me, Bill Tittle, uh, at any time. Thank you very much. Please join me in prayer. Powerful God, we turn to you in times of trial and need, realizing that we do not have the control over every area of our lives. We strive to put forth an image of having everything together. And so when the unexpected happens, we feel lost. In those times, rather than being frustrated or scared, help us to turn to you, taking comfort in the fact that you do have control that you understand more fully what is happening in any moment than we could ever hope to. Help us to let go of our anxiety and concern and know that the creator of the universe is all around us. Calming God, as we approach the holiday season, remind us to take moments to breathe, reflect, and be grateful. There are so many things during this time of year to be thankful for, but many of us get caught up in the hustle and bustle, the cooking and shopping, the parties and events, forgetting to pause and remember our blessings. Provide us with opportunities to be thankful, to tell those in our lives how important they are, to reflect on the blessings that we have. We also pray for those who feel pain or grief with the coming season. We recognize that not all holiday memories are joyful, or that the loss of friends and loved ones can cause pain during this time. Help us to be sensitive to the needs of others, knowing that not everyone feels joyful and happy around the holidays. God of peace, we lift up those struggling with illness of any kind, whether physical, mental, or emotional. We pray for strength and healing, for good doctors and nurses and healthcare workers. We ask that people are able to get the care that they need without hindrance or judgment, and that their friends and families can be supportive and understanding. Lord, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, I'm Zach Ruprecht. And I'm Sally Ruprecht. Right now, I'm nervous. I'm not used to talking on video. Have any of you been nervous? Do you think you would feel nervous talking in front of a bunch of kids? Well, whether you know it or not, we need you. Right now, we would like to learn from you. We would like you to teach us. And, and we would like to get to know you. Here's a little bit about me. I'm 10. Have any of you been 10? See, we already have that in common. I like to sew, play with dolls, oh, and I like to read. And I also like Cheetos. I'm eight. I don't just like Cheetos. I love Cheetos. I also like math, baseball, and football. My favorite team is the Kansas City Chiefs. Do any of you have a favorite team? You may have already taught Sunday school here when your kids or your friends' kids were raised here. And we know you do a lot of volunteering already. But we have one more favor to ask you. Please be a Sunday school teacher for one Sunday during this year, just one. You wouldn't be teaching alone. You'd be with another teacher who'd been here, who, who's been here before and who knows the ropes. If you're still feeling nervous or unsure, Miss Krista can't answer any questions you have. Her information is on the bulletin. If just 10 of you decided to teach Sunday school, that would be 10 different opportunities for us to get to know you and for you to know us. So please sign up to teach Sunday school and teach us about the Bible or share something about the God that you've been thinking about. We aren't picky. Thank you for teaching.